It's the 18th of June, 1306. Robert the Bruce is about to experience one of the most crucial and defining days of his life. If you want to know why and what happened, with some information you've probably never heard of, then this is the video for you. Hiya, I'm Bruce Fumi from Scotland History Tours. If you're interested in the people, events and places in Scottish history and you want some great ideas about places to visit in Scotland, then subscribe to my YouTube channel and click on the notification bell. That way you'll be notified every time I make a new YouTube video. In the meantime, let me tell you a story. Okay, so I want to tell you about the events of the 18th and the 19th of June, 1306. Now, some of you all know nothing about Scottish history and some of you will be aficionados. So let's have a quick recap. Four months ago, in a church in Dumfries, Robert Bruce murdered a competitor. A competitor who'd probably grasped him up to Edward I of England. So what had John come and snitched about? Scotland no longer existed. For the first of three times that I can think of in history, it had been subsumed into England. Now, if you can think of a different number, then tell me in the comment section below. Anyway, Bruce wanted to re-establish Scotland as a country and put himself in charge as king. Now, Cummin wanted Scotland to be an independent country. It's just that he wanted John Balliol to be king. It wasn't what you said, it was the way that you said it. In a medieval world with no internet or even postal service, things moved at a lightning speed. On the 11th of February, Bruce kills John Cummin. By the 25th of March, he's crowned King Robert I at Schoon. By the 5th of April, Edward I of England has appointed Aymer de Valence, Earl of Pembroke, to sort out Scotland in general and Bruce in particular. By the 18th of June, de Valence is in charge of a sizeable, though a not insurmountable force in the walled city of Perth. Wow! Who needs high-speed railways, eh? Now let's put some meat on the bones that will be hanging from a gibbet if you don't get this right. De Valence has arrived in Perth and he's not dicking about. This is personal. He's Edward's cousin and he's the brother-in-law of John Cummin, who you murdered four months ago. Not only that, but Edwards told him to raise the dragon banner. The dragon banner. No chivalry, no rules, no quarter. Not only that, but the majority of Scotland is on his side. I'm talking 55% would rather be in vassalage to England. Does that sound crazy? It's possibly closer to 75%. Let's remember, not four months ago, you murdered one of the leading nobles of the country. From the common family. The most powerful and important family in the country. And you did it in a church. You've been excommunicated. It's a wonder anyone supports you, for goodness sake. <clears throat> so how is it that Bruce managed to get support from even a quarter of the country? and managed to be crowned at Schoon, led to the seat of inauguration by Lady Fife, the wife of another John Cummin, whose cousin you've just... How is it that an excommunicate in the religious atmosphere of medieval Europe is able to be crowned king? Here's the bizarre thing. Because of the church. Yes, there were four bishops at his inauguration. The Bishop of St Andrews had voluntarily rushed back from Berwick for the event. The Bishop of Glasgow had absolved Bruce of murder on holy ground and he'd even given him the timbers from Glasgow Cathedral to build siege engines. And the Bishop of Murray was up telling his flock that supporting Robert the Bruce against Edward I was as good as going on crusade. Find me an Arab that wants to buy some sand, I've got a salesman. It seems like that, doesn't it? Yeah? What does this tell you? Caught in the moral dilemma between Edward I and Robert the Bruce, the highest churchman in the land chose the murderer who's been excommunicated. How evil must the English be? Now, there's a very good political reason the church supported Scottish independence, and I'll maybe cover that in another video. But you clicked to hear about the Battle of Medvin. 
I also promise you a detail that you wouldn't already know. But the truth of the matter is that Methven wasn't so much a battle as an ambush. And it's the context that's huge in this set of circumstances. The point is that Bruce had most of the country against him. He'd crossed the River Forth with 60 men at arms. 60. Most Scots had supported John Balliol as king. And rather than support a murdering usurper, who we found out last week was also a racist as well, apparently, they would rather be subsumed into England. Even the MacDougalls, who'd supported the patriotic cause, switched sides to the pro-English side rather than support Bruce. People were calling him King Hob. Folk were laughing at him in the streets. In the three months since he'd declared himself king, the Cummins, remember, They'd got their allies together, they'd been gathering strength. Edward of England has sent a force with more to come. Bruce has two things on his side. The support of the church and the momentum of that part of the population that just wants Scotland to have its own monarch again, even if it is a murdering excommunicate. But many of his knights who stood by him on his side wore white surcoats. That way their coat of arms wasn't shown. And if the cause was lost, as it probably would be, then nobody would know it was them. That shows you how bad his position was. A battle won might bring momentum. It might bring support. It might even bring the MacDougalls round. On the other side, Aymer de Valence had arrived in Perth with an unconvincing force. Now, he had more to come and he probably felt pretty confident that with Scottish support that eventually Bruce would be hanging around waiting to be drawn and quartered. But things were unpredictable. One way or another, this had been going on for 20 years. And if William Wallace had taught him anything, it was that a lot of damage can be done with a little patriotic fervour. De Valence had to get this sorted quickly. The stakes were huge on both sides. So, in the three months that he's been king, Bruce has built on the 60 that had accompanied him across the force in the first place. Now he had a reasonable sized force. So on the 18th of June, he arrives at the gates of Perth and he challenges Aymer de Valence to come out and fight. Aymer de Valence looks at Bruce's force, he looks at his own force, and he says, no, it's Sunday. Let's fight tomorrow. And Bruce agrees. He takes his men and he camps at Medvin, which is walking distance from Perth. I know, because I've walked home from the berry picket. And so, the Scots make camp. They take off their armour, they put down their weapons, they soak in a warm redox bath. They even put their foot in those, you know those wee tanks with the wee fish that eat your dead skin? Oh! A third of them go off foraging for food. So when the English cavalry surprise them with a charge through the camp, killing, capturing and devastating everything, the Scots have no order, no weapons, no protection. The Battle of Methven wasn't a battle. At best it was an ambush. You could even say a massacre. Those deceitful, unchivalrous, evil English. Or were they? They were flying the dragon banner. Yes, they were sneaky and devious, but they'd put up a massive sign outside the shop warning you that they were going to be ruthless, brutal and unforgiving. It's not like when Cargo Motors in Burton sells your wife a dodgy motor. I mean, if they had a sign outside saying, we sell you cars that are criminally dangerous, come and see our extensive range, that would be different, wouldn't it? Yeah? You would know what you were getting. They were displaying a big dragon banner. It's like flying the Jolly Roger when you're going through the Nothing to Declare channel at customs. You know they were pirates. Of all the grudges that Scots hold against the English, this should not be one of them. Now Bruce went on to achieve great things, okay? But this must have been a low point of hubris and naivety to camp within walking distance of an enemy force, flying the dragon banner, allow his men to disarm, go off hunting, not post sentries. Are you crazy? 
You've got to know what's going to happen. Some of his best men and his most loyal supporters were killed or captured to be executed later. This was a disaster. Now, in the confused state of things, Bruce himself was captured, was nearly captured, was captured, then released. Who knows? But here's the thing that you've probably not heard of. I hadn't heard about it until I read about it in a little book called Battleground Persia. I'll leave a link below so you can go and buy the book, okay? Uh, you can click through, it'll take you to Amazon, right? <clears throat> now, uh, tell me in the comment section, by the way, below, if you've heard this story. Now remember, they're all relaxed, they weren't in battle gear, right? So apparently, Bruce gets captured. But the English don't realise who he is. But once he's in custody, there was a Scottish knight fighting on the side of the English, and his name was John de Halliburton, and he knew who Bruce was. But when he got the chance, he set him free. Now this was a truly heroic act. Bruce had no chance of winning this war, and Halliburton must have known the gory end that awaited him if he was caught. This was an incredible feat of bravery. Bruce fled north and west and managed to gather together a bedraggled force. They hadn't won a battle. They'd been practically wiped out. And now they were attacked by the McDougalls. And then attacked again. Until King Hob was little more than an outlaw on the run. Of course, the story of Robert the Bruce is that of overcoming adversity. And this must have been one of the most sobering, one of the most tempering lessons of Robert Bruce's life. A tempering of the cold steel brought down at Bannockburn, you might say. You see, we know how the story ended. But imagine Robert the Bruce had been captured at Medvin. History is written by the victors. So Bruce's history was his story. If he'd been captured at Medvin, it would have been Edward's story. And Bruce would have been just another traitor to suffer the same gory death as Wallace. And today both would be forgotten as we marched under St George's Cross. It's easy to over-dramatise single events in history. That's why I do it. Every battle has its heroes, but Bruce was certainly not the hero of this one. The real hero was on the English side. If not for John de Halliburton, on these moments, history turns. The Battle of Medvin was a defeat for Robert the Bruce, but it was a victory for Scotland, thanks to John de Halliburton. If you've enjoyed this video, please like, share, subscribe, and click the notification bell to receive updates. I mean, Doc is going to be a lama alive. Cheerio and Drasta.